Hi, I'm Harold Jansen. I'm the Board of Governors Teaching Chair. Today we're going to talk about writing at uh, post-secondary level. And so we've asked three professors to join us. So I have Janae Nugent from the Department of History, which is one of those writing intensive disciplines. Uh, we have Cliff Lope, who's the Director of the Academic Writing Program. And we have David Slump from Education, who knows a lot about how teaching is taught and developed, especially before students come to university. So I'm going to start by just observing this is something I've stolen. David made this comment to me once that if you want to get a bunch of professors really riled up, you get them talking about the quality of their student writing, and then you can pretty much just let them go and they will uh, talk on and on and on. So as the first question, I want to start with Janae on this, is what have we seen, what do you see in student writing? Good and bad, but mostly bad is what we, we talk about. So what, what have been your observations? Okay, well, there's a lot of uh, pet peeves that are sort of popular, and in fact, our department has created a fact sheet of pet peeves of instructors, so we've com <laughs> um, come together to uh, come up with this so that we can give it out to students who are struggling with their writing, um, because it is something that might uh, sort of trigger what they're doing in their own writing, and that is um, everything from misspelling uh, basic words uh, to misunderstanding when to use the there, there, and there, uh, <laughs> and um, all the way straight up to you know clarity of writing. Uh, do you have an argument? Can you actually uh, develop that argument in a logical and coherent manner so that you can communicate effectively to somebody? One of the really big things is paragraph formation. Uh, do students know how to actually write a paragraph with a, t with a clearly articulated topic sentence uh, that they are then going to support with evidence through, their, through that discussion? And then can they link it to the next paragraph that they're going to go to? So there's a wide variety of writing issues that uh, people are challenged with in teaching their students to write. Let's square with your experience, Cliff. Do you see those kinds of things as well? Well, you see a lot of that, but I'm kind of interested in other things. and. Uh, the two things that I thought about when we, we started to talk about this panel were the first that I think you see a lot of confusion. I don't think a lot of people know what writing is. They don't know how, it, how to you know, learn and how to think about teaching writing, first of all. And then the second thing I think is inexperience. So a lot of students get to university. And as Janae noted, that's the manifestation, I think, of a lot of pretty serious problems. And often those problems get addressed in very prescriptive ways. And I don't think those are especially helpful ways. So uh, when we try to talk about writing and, and introducing student to, students to academic culture, we start to think about you know, the context in which the writing occurs and much more pragmatic attitudes toward how to think about what you're asking or what your students to do when you make a, you know, create assignments and then how to create, um, get them to start to think about the context in which they're working. So, so confusion, I think, and just a complete uh, lack of understanding of what language actually is, and then um, that second part of inexperience. And I think both, both of those things you can just so easily address. So. Is that what you've, you've seen? What, what yeah, you think? I think actually that resonates well with a lot of the things I look at. Um, I'm also quite interested in, uh, in audience and a student's ability to understand audience. Um, a lot of my assignments in my courses will uh, get students to, to write for an academic audience, for a public audience, and for a professional audience. And a lot of my students really struggle with how does what I'm doing change when I change the audience I'm writing for. So that's an important one. And I'm always looking at um, idea development. How solidly are students developing ideas? How strong are those ideas? How well supported are they? Those are the, those are the big things that, that I pay a lot of attention to. So, so I'm struck by with what you're saying. A lot of what we're dealing with is the students that come in, right? I mean, they, we don't get these blank slates or these well, or the other side, these very well crafted, well formed students. Mm -hmm. um, so, so why why do we see this? What's your experience? Are they just not being taught this in other levels? Are we doing a bad job at university? Is it a bit of both? Um, well, I'm thinking in particular, um, I'm teaching a first year class, so I have mainly first semester students coming from high school. And um, I think I see learning as a series of steps. And so in high school, they learn to write, um, and it's often formulaic. And so they have a formula that, that they're following. 
Um, they have teachers who have particular uh, things that they're focusing in on. And then when they come to university, it's a different audience, which is really important. Um, and so they have to re-gear themselves towards an academic paper. Um, and every discipline might have a different focus that they are trying to emphasize as they are teaching those writing skills. So example for history, it's about creating arguments and proving mm -hmm. your argument. It's a very important part of what we do and so that they can be articulate in that particular fashion. Um, and so, you know, in first year, they're struggling to change their shift. Uh, and they're also um, beginning to be given a bit more leeway in terms of moving away from the formula that they've been taught. So, uh, for example, an introduction with three points that they're going to prove <laughs> with three paragraphs and then a conclusion. Well, that's, that's a good formula to learn how to have the structures and the mechanics. Um, but, you know, things become more complicated and we want to encourage that higher level of thinking once they get to university. And so um, they have to move away from that comfortable formula, I think. And so, and then some of the things that maybe weren't emphasized in terms of grammar and uh, those types of focuses um, might need to now get some, some interest and it's just, you know, just growth and development, I think. I really observed that formulaic thing. I'm teaching first year for the first mm -hmm. time this year in a long time, and I gave the students their uh, paper assignment. And after a couple of weeks, a student came up to me and said, well, so I learned in high school there's two kinds of essays. There's this kind or this kind. Which kind is this one? And I said, it's the kind I gave you. <laughs> like, I'm not going to let you off the hook that easily. But I was just really struck yeah. by, yeah. like, since when did writing fit into these boxes? So mm -hmm. where does that come from? David and um, in, in Alberta, I think uh, a major part of the problem we have is a provincial achievement test and a diploma yeah, exam program absolutely. that's really valuing all the wrong things about writing and writing development. Um, and so students are being taught how to, and this is true at the grade 3, the grade 6, the grade 9, the grade 12 levels. So it's through the system from the very beginning when they first start learning how to write all the way through to high school. They're learning how to write under tight time constraints essays on topics or, or stories on topics that they haven't seen until they sit for the exam. Um, and so, and, and these are pretty high stakes assessments for a lot of students. I mean, the diploma exam is worth 50% of a kid's mm -hmm. final grade. Achievement tests are used to rank schools in the, in the public newspapers and that. Um, so there's a lot that's riding on, on these assessments. So there's a lot of pressure to make sure kids do well on this. And the skill set needed to write um, a timed impromptu essay or composition is a very different skill set from the kind of skill set you need to, to develop to thrive as an academic writer, for example, at the university. And so things like the five paragraph essay, um, it's a coping mechanism, mm -hmm. right? You need to, in three hours, write two essays. They need to be organized, they need to be polished, they need to have ideas developed well, right? So that sort of generative approach to developing ideas that we might expect students to do at the post-secondary level is something that a lot of these kids are being discouraged from doing. They're saying, you've got to figure it out before you start writing. You've got to have your outline there. You've got to nail it all down because there's no way in three hours when you're writing two essays that you're going to be able to sort of explore your ideas and then find out a way to shape them and then at some point find a way to polish all that work at the end, right? So I think that's a major part of the problem is, is our, our large-scale assessment program in this province is really setting kids up for failure when it comes to post-secondary writing. Cliff, I've seen you sort of agreeing with that. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, as David noted, that uh, that model is, is it's useful as an institutional or a management kind of uh, device, but ultimately it creates one of the biggest problems, I think, is just this notion of decontextualized language, mm -hmm. right, that you can actually you're not really writing about anything, right? And one of the first things we try to do, um, say, in the writing program is get people to think about the context in which they're writing and the genre that's appropriate to that context. So language does things, right? And then I think if you don't have a clue of why you're writing and, and the kind of expectations that surround a genre, and I think uh, it's going to be very hard to succeed in that kind of yeah. uh, genre. And I think our schools get stuck not just with that model uh, in a, in a, and it's, it's useful for all kinds of, I think, assessment purposes probably, but I don't think it's very helpful for learning or recognizing the power of language. And then the next thing I would say is that one of the other things it does is it kind of, it, uh, it gets stuck at a level of expressivity too, right? That, uh, that, you know, our culture is kind of rife with, right? That we live in a world, I think, where self-expression is, is probably the default method of, of communication, mm -hmm. right? And um, 
which is fine, uh, but you get to university, which is a place where knowledge gets made, and students have no clue to how, as to how to think about the knowledge-making activities, which include things like citation or introduction or conclusion or analyses and partitioning and division and classification of their ideas, right? So to me, it's back to that notion of inexperience. And I always try to, you know, allay my students' worry by saying, look, you guys, why would you have any experience in academic writing if you haven't participated mm -hmm. in academic culture? But if you want to participate successfully in this world, here's how this group communicates. And it's very different, as you noted, mm -hmm. from the kinds of things that our students are typically used to doing, they often have that very prescriptive notion that there's one correct way to write. And I think a genre-based awareness uh, gives the students a set of tools to recognize that there are countless ways to write. And what is equally problematic, I think, is that that singular way to write is often associated with um, you know, sort of sets of value judgments, right? That, uh, and a certain educated class knew how to do it mm -hmm. and so forth, and that language is unchanging and that there is only one correct way to do something. So I always use the analogy, say, of a text message in a research paper early on in my classes, and I think students are used to that complaint tradition which kicks in and, and kind of suggests that there is one group of language users who know how to do this and no one else does. You're either born with mm -hmm. it or something like that, or you have a facility or talent. And, my sense is, you know, and, and students hear this all the time in, in the discussions about how the kids these days don't know how to use language, they don't know how to spell, they don't know how to do whatever. And I say, well, and then of course they get lumped under the, the, the classification of being illiterate, which is nonsense, right? They actually have, they're profoundly literate in certain genres mm -hmm. and inexperienced in others. And they're very easy to pick up once you start to pay attention to the social situation in which those genres circulate and I think students find that to be quite a relief so that's and then to just to add on to the point that David started to develop there that schoolroom essay I think it works perfectly well in the context of that sort of genre and those kinds of expectations that surround it but it's not going to work particularly well mm -hmm. in research culture where we have different objectives different ends and different ways to achieve those ends so mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. And the problem is it sets kids up with that idea that this is the way to write, especially because this kind of, this kind of formula comes all the way through the system. It's there, it's what they're introduced to and it just follows them all the way through the system. And that, so they really do come out with this idea. I remember doing a study with first year writers at the U of A where they talked about the golden structure. Um, and that was really, that, that was it. It was the golden structure because it was the only one they knew, right? And I think picking up off what Cliff said, um, I, I'm working on developing an approach that looks at a problem-solving based approach to writing. That looks at defining the rhetorical context as a problem that students le need to learn how to solve. So it's looking at who am I writing for, who's the discourse community, what values and expectations do they bring to their transaction with the text I'm creating, what genres function within that discourse community, what rhetorical moves work within that discourse community, what kind of processes make sense in that kind of context, uh, how does that community approach the subject matter that I'm after, that I'm focusing on, and getting kids to learn how to unpack these, these rhetorical contexts, make sense of them, so that then they can learn how to respond to them. But what our kids get through the, through the K-12 system often is there's one context. So they're not learning how to develop those kind of problem-solving skills. And you know, the other side of the problem is often at the post-secondary level, no one's teaching them this stuff either. Right? Um, looking at a study that Roger Graves is doing at the U of A, where he looked at the number of genres of first-year writing assignments that students have to do across lots of different disciplines. And it's seven, between seven and a dozen different genres of text first-year students are being asked to write in, in, you know, whether it's a phys ed program or a nursing program or a liberal arts program, right? And the question is, are instructors in any of these programs actually working with students to say, here's how you, here's how you, here's how you write this kind of genre, here's, here's how you do this. Often they don't get that instruction and so students are really left struggling with, here's what worked in high school, here's what's being asked of me, 10 different types of things being asked of me, but I don't have a clue how to make sense of any of them. And that's, that's setting them up for failure. That's one of the things that struck me. There's yeah. the, the genre of academic writing, but there's lots of subgenres within yeah. that. So when you're describing yeah. history, it sounds very much like political science. We have very similar kinds of essay styles, yeah. but English is going to do something very different. And so students, they never take a greater variety of courses than they do in their first year when they're yeah. probably least prepared to be adaptable. So it's, it really is setting them up for a lot of failure. Yeah. If you wanted to comment on that, or 
Um, no, I, I mean, I completely agree that students are um, challenged, and it's their first, often it's their first year, mm -hmm. they're challenged with a whole range of things coming into university. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, writing is just one of many aspects. Look, of that, we actually so. are lucky. We get yeah. to very have this very narrow focus. We've mastered a very particular kind of writing, and we work many years in our career in this. Mm -hmm. and. I don't, I, I'd probably struggle writing an essay for an English class too because I never have to write for mm -hmm. that kind of thing or write something more technical for a science class because I never get asked to do that either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's sometimes we have expectations of students that we don't e couldn't even fulfill ourselves, right. I think. And yeah. I find that they're really evaluation driven as well, yes. right? They're very, very concerned about getting it right, mm -hmm. what that final grade will be. Um, and so I think a lot of coming into university is kind of learning about what education is, or at least how we would perceive education, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. growth and development and uh, skills development. It's not just about that grit, that letter grade at the end as well, and that um, there's a lot to be learned from different genres instead of being frustrated, but you know, open it up, embrace it, and see um, you know, where you can go with that. I've actually really observed that students want to do well yeah. at it, though. I mean, I think we, mm -hmm. especially as we get older and grumpier, like I, I am through my career, but I think we sort of assume students are, oh, they're not motivated. But I've actually found yeah, they, they want to do well at absolutely. it. And they're challenged by it and a little intimidated and, and uh, are willing to work at it, but you have to create the conditions for them to succeed. And, and I'd argue the problems become more complex for these students than it was for previous generations of students. So the modalities with, through which and in which they write, mm -hmm. the platforms through which they compose, all of these things are rapidly expanding. And that. so um, the, the, the demands on them in terms of just multimodal kind of design, in terms of composition, is, is much greater now than, than it was in the past. And, um, and I think the range of kinds of texts that they're being asked to create is also much greater. Not just for students, but also when you look at people going out into the workforce. The workforce has changed fundamentally as well. Where you have this, this stable career model seems to be kind of evaporating and we have this more itinerant kind of career model. Where people are moving between jobs much more frequently and they need to develop again that sort of skill set to say, okay, I'm in this new, new place, this new space. How do, I, how do I make this work? How do I write effectively within this space, right? So it's a, a much more complex problem, I think, today than it was. So helping people succeed at university is one part of it, but ideally what we're trying to do here is equip people to succeed for the rest of their lives at, at this. Well, I mean, this raises often, I've tried to move beyond just blaming our students for when things aren't going well. And clearly, I mean, like, like I said, when we talk to our colleagues, writing is a problem. Um, so what are, what are we not doing? What, what, what are we not doing at the university level that we should be doing? David's identified some things, but I mean, Cliff, you have a lot of experience working with uh, students on this. Well, some, and um, I think that here's a great time to sort of use a very an outrageous quotation from Stanley Fish's How to Write a Sentence and How to Read One. So he begins mm -hmm. with this kind of, he's quite an ironic fellow and a combative one, I guess, but he says that students should be suing their teachers and their teachers' teachers for malpractice, right? <laughs> and in some ways, I actually quite agree with them. And I think we don't do a particularly good job, partly because a lot of, you know, people who work in post-secondary education farm out the most important work that we can do with our students to the most peripheral members of communities, often to grad stu students, pardon me, and, and or to programs that are, you know, just sort of wedged in without the right amount of time to do this. And my sense is, and you know, picking up on some of the ideas David or Janae or you were talking about Harold, is a, a university is a fantastic time in a student's life to try on a bunch of different disciplines and try on a bunch of ways to think about uh, communicating and using language effectively. And those are not new ideas, right? I mean, the oldest sort of epistemes in the West are, of course, linked up to rhetoric and from the sophists onward, right? And these were, you know, th these were ways of looking at the world and looking at your life and, and looking at things that you're doing and recognizing the importance of language in them. And I think it's bizarre that we are raising or teaching students to imagine that language is just, you know, a bunch of novels that you have to read for a provincial exam and missing out on the power and the beauty of language, whether it's a poem or a film that you watch or a well-written piece of research paper. These are beautiful documents in their own way and learning to respect language and people who can use it well, I think is important. And to work with instructors who recognize, you know, some of those basic ideas that there's no single, you know, correct way to use language. There are more or less effective ways. And 
I think when you can focus on effectiveness and not on correctness, you can shut down a lot of that anxiety and a lot of that concern. And you can actually start to help students to think about, well, what are you being asked to do in this document, in this assignment? How are you going to go about doing it? How do you want to accomplish it? What kind of audience do you want to address? And they're really basic habits. And I think a lot of our students get here. They expect a magic pill they can take to become better <laughs> writers. And I think there are a lot of their instructors mm -hmm. think that. They can just shuffle, shuffle them off to the writing center, to an, a writing program or an mm -hmm. education class or something. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, you know, the best people, you know, the best writers I've ever encountered uh, in, you know, academic or non-academic context, I think they read a lot. They think about what they read and how they encounter language. They think about what language can do and how they can use some of these rhetorical features to work in those genres. And they, probably for our purposes, they make the connection that disciplines have routines, right? They have an ethos. They have a way of doing their business. And that can be quite bewildering for students, but it also is quite, I think, liberating and exciting. And I think, I hate to see writing kind mm -hmm. of displaced in this, in, you know, to the margins of the ways that we learn and try to teach our students here. And uh, I, think, I think a lot of universities that are starting to address these questions, um, it's much more than just creating a writing center or something like mm -hmm. that. It's actually recognizing that writing intensive uh, instruction has a place in disciplinary action, in history mm -hmm. programs, in mm -hmm. education faculties and things like that. So mm -hmm. I'm taking that. No, no. The, the challenge I always find is somebody who doesn't teach writing or focus on it. I mean, I'm a political scientist and I, I'm always struggling with how much I want to focus on teaching writing as opposed to teaching what I really know and what I really love. Right. And I, how do you strike that balance, Janae? Because you have to you have to equip students to succeed, but on the other hand, you don't want to spend half of your class discussing writing as opposed to discussing history. Yeah, I mean, it is it is a bit of a struggle, although at its core, history is writing. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to spend the time. We need to stop. We need to, I, I mean, everybody in my department will stop and spend time talking about the papers, the expectations, the audience, um, how, you know, and, and go through some of the common um, pitfalls and how they might deal with them. Uh, but there are other techniques, which I think is what this panel would be very helpful, is what are some of those things that we can do without turning this into every single class as a writing class, right? Because we still are dealing with the content and disciplines that are separate. Uh, and so it's we have a, a second year class on methods and concepts for majors where they uh, spend a lot of time learning how to write and rewrite, and that's the focus of that class. But it's specifically geared towards history, the discipline of history. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one way. Um, one thing that I do is I, in my third and fourth year classes in particular, is that I um, focus in on one aspect of writing that I want them to really develop. And uh, we make that the theme as we go through seminar discussions. Um, you know, the assignments that they're doing, that sort of a thing, so that we can really hone in on one aspect because I just can't spend the entire class talking about writing. So I'm, you know, I, I'll hit some students and I won't <laughs> hit other ones. <laughs> it just depends on what they are. Um, but, you know, you have to have that balance somehow and you have to make choices. And I mean, I'm sure this is the same thing with high school students coming into us. This, the teachers have had to make choices about what they can yeah. spend time teaching the students. And so. One of the things I've increasingly done is when we're, we're doing readings, actually, if there's one that's particularly well written, we'll actually yeah, not just absolutely. talk about the argument, but talk about, well, look at the way this was written. Why was this written well? Why was this easy to read and understand as opposed to this other thing I had to read, which was borderline incomprehensible, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and there are some things that, I mean, they're still worthwhile ideas, but why was this one more effective and actually look at examples of good writing and just spend not a lot of time, but might spend a couple of minutes commenting on some of the things that they did that made, made that writing more understandable. Yeah. A powerful thing we do in our... Um, in, our, uh, in some of our education courses, the, uh, the assessment group that teaches the undergrad assessment courses have really looked at just principles of effective assessment design. And often, if you apply some of that work to your writing instruction, uh, it really works well. So one of the things we do is if students get an, a, a new assignment, um, we'll have samples of student work uh, that they'll sit down in small groups, they'll look through it, they'll look at what are they seeing in these samples, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses that they're seeing. Um, then we'll build sort of a common set of criteria as a group around that then I might compare that against a scoring guide that I've already created myself. We'll look at what did you notice that's similar to what's in my scoring guide, what's 
in my scoring guide or what's not in my scoring guide that you've noticed that maybe I should, should add to it. Um, and then they go out, they do their draft work, they, they kind of work through that. Then often we bring it back in and we do uh, you know, a checklist or a, again the scoring systems there. They look at two or three samples of each other's work. Um, they, they go against the checklist or, or the scoring system and they kind of evaluate each other. They take the feedback and they go back and they rework and, and, and redesign. So it's a process that gets them actively engaged with the genre they're being asked to create, um, get them thinking about what do I need to do. Then when they've created a draft of it, it gets them a chance to reflect on that and go, okay, did I actually achieve what I was hoping to do? Were there problems with it? What's really interesting often is we, we hear that peer feedback, students are often unhappy with peer feedback because they think, if I'm a strong student, I get feedback from a weaker student, there's no benefit to me. But the research actually shows us that the benefit isn't really in the feedback, it's actually in the process of critically engaging with other people's work um, and then applying that to your own. So the strong student sees the weak student's work and goes, oh, this is what's making, that's a clear sense of why my work is strong. Where the weak student sees the stronger student's work and goes, oh, this is where, where the problem is. I had a great example when I taught a grad course at the University of Ottawa when I was there. And I had a student who I was working on all semester long to improve his final paper and, and he just wasn't, I don't know, just wasn't getting it, it wasn't coming along. We did this peer review session, he looked at two of his colleagues' pieces and he came back to me after class and he had a week left at this point. He was like, oh, I'm in so much trouble, I have so much work I have to do on this paper. You know? And it was that moment where he saw these other examples where he realized, oh, this is what I'm not doing in sufficient depth or detail, right? So um, those are processes that, that seem to work, you know, quite effectively in some of the stuff that we do. I'm a big fan of peer review. Yeah. Do you use it, Janae or Cliff, in your, your teaching at all? Or? Uh, somewhat. Um, probably not as much or as successfully as others, but uh, I tend to uh, be pretty interested in um, those more pragmatic questions about what actual pieces of speech do and parts of speech and, and uh, whether from the you know grammatical level right on up to sort of paragraphs and, and larger combinations of sections and things like that. And yeah, we do exercises of peer review. Um, um, but I think one of the most uh, liberating things that we try to do in the writing classes I'm involved in is um, just to get students to recognize that they're, they will be expected to write very differently in different contexts, right? So that bewilderment that they feel, in, whether it's in a grad class or in a, in a history class or an undergrad class, that you know, there are a lot of different ways that the, the knowledge-making activities that we try to um, replicate and inculcate here um, can actually start to occur. So those are all fantastic, you know, I think, and, and great. They take time, and, and often there's such pressure to cover our material and I'm sympathetic to, you know, you talk about the teachers in school systems and teaching for a sets of exams, well, we have our own constraints, right? I mean, in 13 weeks, we are asked to do a lot in an introduction to writing. And um, in some ways I often end up feeling, you know, close that class off feeling like uh, it was pretty unsuccessful because <laughs> we just started to talk about some of these things and it would be nice to be able to take some time to, to you know, to develop those and unpack those and certainly effective peer review um, you know, occasions, they take a lot of time. I think they're quite useful. Um, where I'd love to do it is first year, but just with the size yeah. of our classes, it's impossible. It's probably where it'd be most effective, actually, mm -hmm. yeah. is to get them seeing each other's work and understanding, learning from each other. But mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you've found a way to pull that off at the first year level. At the first year big level. Class, or big classes. No, it's challenging. Uh, the one thing I do do is I give them bonus marks if they go to the grad tutors. Oh, okay. And so they have a, peer, a form of peer review in that way. Yeah. And that the grad tutors are meant to be reviewing and, and um, going through their process. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that depends on resources and how many graduate Absolutely. students we have. So yeah. this semester we don't have as many hours available, so it's mm -hmm. more difficult to do. So you know, there's a lot of practicalities that come in with that. Um, I have used peer review in a number of different classes in different ways and to varying levels of success. Mm -hmm. uh, often you get students who say, well, I don't want to be mean. And I mm -hmm. say, well, yeah, well, the D is a lot meaner. Teaching them to be honestly clear. critical in yeah. a constructive way, that's, yeah. that's a skill to learn. Like mm -hmm. there, there's some benefits to that as well. And it's, well, it's, it's, a lot of our colleagues don't even understand no, that, right? Absolutely. They'll yeah. they'll put a check mark here or a cross out something. On the way here, I heard two students talking about my professor just wrote a big X in my first paragraph of my paper, right? And I thought, 
what a tremendous, you know, a great example of a failure, right? Of, yeah. of, you know, we should know better than that, right? And and I think one of the things we can learn is to is to how to respond to student writing, and it takes a lot of time, right? A lot of our colleagues dish this off and and get, you know, they might not spend the time to to do that, but I think to meaningfully and usefully respond to a piece of student writing, and I I tend to believe that I spend a lot of time doing that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and responding not necessarily, you know, to try to track my own uh, responses and experiences as a reader, as someone using that text, right? As trying to understand yeah. an argument, un trying to, you know, account for. And there's, people have talked about this a lot, it's not original to me, the Think Aloud protocol, for example, of ways to respond to student writing. But when you can sort of model that for your students and you can get them to sort of do that for themselves or to get people they know to do that, to read something, and instead of saying, is it good or bad, is it right or wrong, to actually start to think, well, what am I trying to do with this text? Is my argument clear? Have I supported my ideas or cited this effectively and things like that? And I think that responsibility lands in our, uh, you know, on our shoulders, right? And I think a lot of us could, you know, need to learn much, you know, to not just, um, you know, to, to, to actually take the time to respond to, to design assignments carefully and then respond to them meaningfully. And it's hard to do when you're, we have responsibilities to do research, to do you know, committee work, and then to, we get a set of papers and, and um, I don't know what your experiences are like, but uh, I would put them off as long as I can and then hope for the best, right? And uh, so I think those are very meaningful sites that we're overlooking for mm -hmm. really effectively and meaningfully and helpfully engaging with you know, our students. As my sense is they want to hear experts who are responding to their work. So. Mm -hmm. I always go in with great, great plans and expectations. <laughs> this year I'm going to actually give much more, much fuller and more constructive feedback, but mm -hmm. the realities of the pressures of the things we have to do from day to day right. sometimes get in the way. So there's two things there. There's the design of assignments and the kind of feedback we give. Mm -hmm. So what are, what are we not doing well in assignments? I've started to look critically at what I've done in paper assignments and realize, man, I'm not doing a great job in a lot of what I'm doing. So what are some of the failures that you see us do in the kinds of assignments we design? I think one of the big things I see is we're not signaling the things we value very well. So students go, I got an A, I got a B, I got a whatever, but I don't really quite understand why, you know. Or I wish I had understood in the process of actually creating this text or this product, you know, what those values were, right? So I think that's an important part of it, is, is, is making that clear for students. Because often, too, they think a lot of it's idiosyncratic. So instructor A, that's what he values, instructor C, that's what she values, instructor B, that's what she values. But um, maybe it's actually not idiosyncratic. Maybe it's a product of what discipline they're in, or maybe it's a product of, you know, the um, the discourse community they're functioning, or the discipline they're working in. Right. So, uh, I think that's an important piece that our students aren't often getting. Yeah, I think articulating our expectations yeah. and and how and what our pedagogical goals are mm -hmm. uh, are. I always find students respond really well to that. I'm giving you this assignment in this particular format because I want you to achieve this. Mm -hmm. And then they go, oh, right. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how that makes a really big difference if you just articulate that yeah. to them. I'm a big fan of the notion that, you know, when we talk, language is socially situated. And if we have all these students here, and a lot of them come here, and I'll ask them early on in our courses, um, you know, what do you think it is that people do at university, right? And uh, one of the things that we probably all wouldn't agree about much, right? But, uh, the, and it's not just that student writing is in a, you know, a dire strait. I don't really think that anyway, but I think we can improve uh, those in those areas. But this is a place where knowledge gets made and student papers are meaningful and legitimate uh, acts of participation in that culture. And in fact, they replicate the things that we do and we had to learn how to do professionally. So to me, one of the most useful things I try to do, or I think it's useful, is to, and this kind of picks up what you were saying, Janae, that um, to try to explain, well, why am I assigning this research paper to you or this summary? And, 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 it, and to explain its position in a knowledge-making culture. So it's not just a nasty sort of assignment that I'm going to give to people to ruin their weekends or lives or whatever it might be. And it's not idiosyncratically assessed. It's actually part of a larger um, set of epistemological, uh, you know, set of you know actions that are occurring 
um, that are really just, you know, that replicate and reflect the things that professional scholars do without thinking, right? And so I do think that our student writers, they are knowledge makers, they are participating in those activities, they are replicating the things we do, including things like citation and um, developing arguments, supporting their cases with proofs and things like that. And I think when you can explain the why to someone, the how gets so much easier. Mm -hmm. So that's a big thing that I try to emphasize. I had no idea this when I was an undergrad. You just kind of were okay at it and figured it out as you went. But when you can start to explain to a student, well, I've asked you to cite, you know, sources that, you know, these kinds of sources for this particular project, let's say, you know, it's not just a, an arcane exercise or, or some sort of, you know, sadistic kind of, uh, um, condition that I've built into the exercise. I want to actually see you working with the sources or the experts in that field and producing knowledge, making a claim, supporting it with evidence and things mm -hmm. like that. So. I think, sorry, I think that it's so important because the message out there so often is go to university to get yeah, a degree, right. to get right. a job, right, about yeah. that. right? Instead of understanding what academia really is, mm -hmm. and that's knowledge production, mm -hmm. and that students are a critical aspect of that. Mm -hmm. um, we as instructors learn so much from them, and they need to be a part of that process. And that's, I mean, I, I talk about yeah. that in every single one of my classes when we talk about papers. It's just so critical um, to change that shift and. And it doesn't, and it doesn't end at the end of the day or at the end of a bachelor's degree either, yeah, right? Exactly. I mean, you're, I think our, a lot of our students come here expecting they'll never need to read and write at an academic <laughs> level again. <laughs> and I said to them, if you think you're going to get into a professional yeah. situation and not going to be reading and writing and not be expected to read and write well, you're deluded, right? And, and then you look at some very specific examples of this, right? And... And then I kind of challenge them to say, well, why not try to do that with a sense of eloquence and style and sophistication? And yes, you might not be writing research papers, but you might be writing legal briefs or case studies or mm -hmm. lectures or, you know, grocery lists. But do it with an elegance and an eloquence that uh, will reflect, pardon me, that will reflect the fact that you are an educated person and mm -hmm. someone that holds a, you know, a, a bachelor's degree or, an, you know, a, a graduate degree. Mm -hmm. I often talk to my students about how academic discourse is, is um, it, it's part of an ongoing conversation uh, and that they, they often don't think they have anything to contribute to that, right? And, and in some ways, assignments often are set up with the idea that your job is, or they, their interpretation of assignment is that your job as a student is to tell me as a professor back what I already told you, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. and, and those are always the worst assignments, right? The worst pieces of writing are the ones where they, um, they're not engaging in the assignment from a position that I, I have a unique set of experiences and perspectives that I can bring to this conversation. Now, you know, I, maybe it isn't going to be earth shattering, it might not, you know, move the discipline in any significant way, but it's going to contribute in a small way to that, to that conversation. And I think students often look at you a little funny when you say, you can, you, you can contribute to that conversation from your, from your place and from what you know. Um, and, but when they, when they take that idea up, often the writing's much stronger uh, as well. I think um, the university is really, this university is really mm. nicely situated, being a liberal education university mm. for that as well. So I sort encourage, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I encourage my students to bring in ideas and perspectives and approaches from other disciplines. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know, bring that to me in a way that I wouldn't have thought of it as a historian. It's a historical paper, sure, that you're writing. But think of it in, you know, the different ways that you may have been thinking about other topics in other classes. So. We, we've, we have a lot of sort of unarticulated assumptions, right, when we give writing assignments. And that's what, when I was reflecting, I'd say, well, write a paper on this and, and just assuming that they would understand what that meant exactly, right? And that's, well, I think the biggest thing that I've learned is we have to be just far more clear about what it is we want them to do and not assume because we, there's a whole bunch of, that, situ, that uh, situated thing that you're talking about, yeah. uh, Cliff, is, is so huge in what we're asking right. them to do. And one of the really, real bizarre misconceptions to me, too, that students show up with, and maybe, you know, you, you hinted at this earlier in the exigencies of, you know, provincial exam testing and whatnot, and um, it's bizarre to think that our schools get in the way of learning, but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think most of my students arrive here think they have no idea what knowledge is, right? They think it's something that's sort of 
um, found somewhere. They can, you know, go dig it up under a rock or something like that. We store it and give them and that some. We're, and we're the purveyors or the high priests that control it. And I just say, get that nonsense out of your head. I mean, knowledge is made. It's not found. And you can participate in the, you know, with a lot of people here who very, do that in very cool ways. It's what's amazing about university culture. This is a place where people get paid to be curious and to answer questions and often very specific, focused, minute questions and in all kinds of interesting disciplines. And I don't think we respect what we do here enough, you know, that that's a remarkable part of a, a culture and a, and a province that can support that and, and you know, has a sort of, a, a, you know, a system, a, you know, a post-sanctuary system and in 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 in, um, in educational systems that, you know, this is, you know, such an incredible um, gift and a privilege we have to be working at places like this. and. To, to see that knowledge isn't, you know, knowledge making is actually not peripheral to that. It's actually what happens in these places and that influences the technologies we use, the social programs that we um, participate in our communities, our the relationships with our friends and families, our, our professional, you know, activities and so forth. So um, I think when you start to emphasize that, um, it starts to make, you know, the, I think a student's experience at a university a lot more engaging, or I hope. So. I agree. As soon as you change that focus to say you're not here to regurgitate, you know, you know yeah, you're yeah. here to create your own understanding, your own idea, communicate that as effectively as you can. There, there's a, I see a major shift in student, in the quality of student work often when, when they're actively encouraged or, you know, pushed into that kind of, kind of focus with their work, so. One of the things that I've, really been struggling with lately is whether we emphasize this particular writing form called the term paper too much, right? This very specific Oh, it's impossible to this emphasize <laughs> that too much. <laughs> There's this 10 to 15 page thing that, especially first and second years, right, that's written in a particular way. But out thinking in the real world, you know, most normal, well-adjusted people don't write a lot of these in their everyday lives. Um, and, and I've wondered the extent to which we are really grading students who've mastered that form rather than developing knowledge or conveying it in different kinds of formats. So do you think we focus too much on this specific kind of writing? And it has an important place, but it's not the only way to express yourself. I, I would suspect there's gonna be a difference depending on the, the faculty and the program. So I think professional programs would probably have a different uh, probably have a different constellation right. of assignments than, than some of the other programs would, right? So we, in the ed faculty, a lot of our assignments are around uh, the kind of professional genres that you have to create, unit plans, lesson plans. We do a lot of reflection. Our program students probably say we reflect them to death in our program, but <laughs> it's an important, it's an important um, core value in our program yeah. too, that they develop the skill set and the habits of mind that make them good reflective practitioners. So we don't apologize too much for it. But, um, and then, yeah, letters to parents, letters to those kinds of public um, audiences as well. So, I mean, the term paper's there, but I would say probably in, in, in the professional faculties it might be emphasized a little bit less than in some of the other disciplines. I don't know. Well, I said it term somewhat, paper. Um, ironically, but I don't think that uh, we should apologize for that. I think if you can read and write a term paper or a research article, you can read and write anything. And, um, and partly because I think it's, there's a lot of uh, tasks and, and you know, cognitive and social that surround that that you need to be good at to be able to do it. So I yeah. think that it, there, oh, is, I there are a lot of skills that it represents. It's not the only kind of writing. It's not the only kind of thing we should be teaching. And there are parts within it that you know, I think we have to be able to teach meaningfully, like how to summarize scholarly articles, how to um, you know, present evidence, and um, how to paraphrase, how to quote, and those are all arts within it. And I always say to my students, and we get a lot of business students in the academic writing program, that chances are you're not gonna be asked to go and write research papers in you know, professional context. But if you think about the skills you've learned and you figure out how to transport them into okay, non-academic situations or personal situations, I mean, ultimately that is to me what is valuable about, a good valuable about a good education is that you can actually figure those things out for yourself. How can I take some of those ideas of, you know, the, from the scholarly genres about how to analyze, how to solve a problem, how to break it into its parts, and then how to respond to them meaningfully, how to do some research to solve it, how to communicate to a, a board or a client or a parent. Uh, you know, 
what my point is, what the evidence I have to prove that case is. I mean, they're basic habits that I think an educated person has to, that we have to, they have to hold and be able to do. And you shouldn't be able to hold a graduate or an undergraduate degree unless you can, right? No, I, I'd agree with you. I've actually been struck by when I've gone off the page a little bit and had students do different kinds sure. of writing assignments. I've seen some students that I thought were just amazing students really struggle with that because they're way out of their comfort zone because they know the, how to do the paper. And I've had students that I maybe would have almost, well, not quite written off, but thought, oh, you know, they're, they're an okay student. And they just excel when I switched the format of the writing. And that has really got me thinking about the extent to which we're assessing what they know and how they can communicate it as opposed to how they can communicate it in this particular form. I don't know if you've experienced this yeah. at all. Am I, am maybe, I, maybe we're just doing a really bad job in focal no, studies. No, no. <laughs> I doubt it's it. entirely possible. Uh, I, in my third and fourth year classes, I usually have two writing assignments, one being the academic term yep. paper, and then one that's usually um, either more creative or is a group project. So I often have them do group writing, uh, which I think is a form a of peer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it's a bit of a peer review process, right? Because they all have to go out and do research for a different part put it all together and then it has to circulate amongst them so that it, it develops into a coherent piece. So they're actively having to work on other people's writing, which I find is usually pretty effective. But the different types, so sometimes, yeah, if you give them the leeway to say, be creative, mm -hmm. and and it, sometimes you just see students thrive. They just shine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so, I mean, I do think that, um, I absolutely agree with what Cliff was saying because I think the, the term paper is critical uh, for the development of all of those skill sets that we want every graduate of a university to have. I mean, they just are so critical for that. Um, but I do think that there are different ways of, of sort of um, pulling it out of students. Yeah. And so um, when they're given an opportunity to have a different type of an assignment, uh, sometimes that also builds their confidence mm -hmm. because they think, well, like, look how well I did on this paper. Well, maybe I can do better. Or maybe I can apply these things that sort of um, uh, either spoke to me because I was interested or because they tapped into my creative side or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. Um, maybe I can take those and actually apply them to my term papers. And so they figure out their own ways of what works for them personally. So it, I, it, I do agree with it's that. It's hard to get that idea. Even a term paper would be a very creative exercise, but that idea of creativity really, I find, often gets lost in what we expect and what our, how our students respond to, that this is your opportunity to be creative. Yeah. And I think um, it gets to an, an important assessment principle around validity in terms of triangulation. So if, if, we, if we only assess through one modality, mm -hmm. then there's an open question about whether or not we're measuring simply facility with that modality as opposed to the actual content or, or disciplinary understandings that the student's developing in a course, right? So if we, you know, if you have a, a written uh, assignment, uh, uh, an oral assignment and a visual design assignment. Now you can you can look at which one of these three is very different score from the other ones. Does that tell me that maybe there's something else that's playing into the score? You know the fact. I think one of the best, uh, one of my favorite assignments uh, from all the years I've been teaching at post secondary was a, it was a visual argument assignment that my students had to do, and one of the students. Um, had looked at this, the Fraser Institute school rankings had come out and she had looked at the 10 largest cities in Ontario. She looked at the top five ranked schools in each city and the bottom five ranked schools in each city. And, um, and then used StatsCan data to look at the socioeconomic profiles of those communities that those schools were based in and also um, data in terms of the school population itself. And um, this beautiful poster on the top is this apple and in red beside it is the, the demographic information of the top ranked school. In the bottom of the poster is this half of an orange. <laughs> and in orange writing beside it is this, the, the demographic profile of the bottom ranked school um, in, uh, in one of the districts. And then just this brief paragraph in the middle which sort of talks about this idea of uh, how significant socioeconomic profiles mm -hmm. of these different schools factored into the rankings in each of the 10 jurisdictions that she had looked at. It's a single page. It's probably the most clear, powerful argument a student has produced for me. Yeah. Uh, in, in, you know. So it gets at all those values, I think, that you're talking about. There's a lot of analysis that goes behind there, um, but uh, it's a much more powerful form of argument often than, say, the long-term paper. And, I know I get students who are good writers and I get them to do these op-ed pieces. It's become a major assignment in a lot of my courses. You know. And I got to getting them to do op-ed pieces because I've done quite a few in the last little while. And 
to take your research, you know, you got a paper that's published in a journal that's 20 pages long, 40 pages long, and now I got to get it into 500 words, otherwise the Globe and Mail is not going to publish it. It's an enormously difficult task to do, right? Um, so it gets at the same skill sets, um, but it, it's just a different way of, of building an argument and representing it. It strikes me one of, the, uh, one of the other challenges that we have is that we all, we work in disciplinary silos, but even as individuals, we work in individual silos, right? So the kinds of things that you might expect in the way you structure assignments might not match up with what your colleagues are doing. It's tough enough to coordinate within a department and a major, let alone to tie into interdisciplinary things or across disciplines. I mean, what, what can or should we be doing to think about how we can scaffold writing ability and the kinds of assignments and expectations we have facing this? I mean, fundamental, it's fundamental to the DNA of a university. This is how we work. I don't know that I would see that as a huge problem, Harold. I mean, I think we live our lives individually and alone. And, and uh, obviously, we participate in social situations. And um, we should expect there to be substantial differences in different professors' classes and different um, um, uh, disciplines and things like that. And I think that difference is good sometimes, right? Even to, you know, sometimes some of the most useful pedagogical experience I had were with bad professors, right? Where you, you <laughs> had to actually, you know, spend so much time trying to figure out what was going on that, um, so I'm not a real proponent of homogenizing everything, right? And, and as if there was one single way to write, but Oddly enough, in the academic writing program, we only look at academic writing, but we always try to look outward from that to try to see how this can, you know, um, you know, link up to other kinds of language use. But I, I do think that if you can read and write at a research-based kind of level, and um, you know, um, we do that. We do it professionally. For for there's a reason that a journal article or a book or they are the coin of the realm, right? If you can concentrate your argument and analysis into those forums. And sure, there are important times when we need to adapt those to other genres. I think that's absolutely common sense. Um, if you can do that, I think you, you're going to be set to be able to be pretty nimble in, in a whole bunch of other genres and, and, and in other social situations, that ones that you might not have studied even, right? But at the end of the day, I, I don't see that as a, I don't consider that a huge worry. So I, I, we, we, our goal in the writing classes is to produce a, you know, a 10 to 15 page research paper. And, but, you know, we, we look at every last word and every last um, sentence in it and, and the conventions in it and uh, right from the title page right to the last entry in the footnote and not in a formalist way, not in a way that, that these are a set of rules that you can remember to be able to, you know, to apply to write a good paper, but more to see the social activity, the remarkable kind of uh, things that are going on around it in the discourse community that is producing it and is expecting you to, to be able to do this activity and will use it as a site of examination and assessment. So I'm not apologetic about that at all or worried about that. So. Yeah, I, I'm, I would take a, a, a different perspective in the sense that um, I think Cliff, you made the point that really students are sort of writing themselves into their disciplines. That's yeah, part of this, yeah. part of what they're being asked to do when they come into you know first year and, and move through a program. And I think um, you know uh, Elizabeth Wardle talks about mutt genres in first year writing. It's sort of these pseudo genres that aren't really the genres of the discipline, but they're sort of these introductory genres that kind of approximate some of those values right. as a starting point. And so I think programs that work very well are ones that have taken sort of a vertical look at their curriculum and said, okay, what's the MUT genre look like in our first year courses? And how do we get students closer to the actual genres of the discipline as they move through the program? So that there's sort of a developmental sequence in the kind of writing assignments we ask students to engage in. I think programs, um, I often see nursing programs seem to do that very well. They have a good sense of how to build students towards the genres that are critical to their discipline. And that, and and students seem to to really thrive under that kind of approach, and um, so I think that sort of focus on a on a vertical curriculum becomes pretty pretty important for that reason. I don't disagree with you. I think variation and and students learning how to make sense of difference um, is an important part of development. So long as we teach them that problem solving kind of skill set that they you know can use to attack those different problems, right? If we're just saying 
yeah, you're, you're going to get exposed to, you know, let's say, uh, you know, 10 different genres in your first year, good luck, right? We're not really, we're not really helping them. But if we're saying in, these are the 10 genres you might get exposed to in your first year, here's some approaches that you can use to figure out how to make sense of those, then they're much more, you know, much, much further ahead. So I think that, that idea of a, of a horizontal curriculum as well can be valuable in that we can maybe be more purposeful in helping students kind of figure out um, what the value in writing for different audiences and in, in different disciplines, right? So I think, I think it, it maybe potentially can speed the developmental process if, uh, not that we homogenize, I think you're right. If, as soon as you go to that approach, I think it, it defeats the purpose. But being more, I think, purposeful in, in the range of difference and then also um, the developmental sequence within the program, I think. Well, I don't helpful. think we're actually saying yeah. different things, David. Right. The, the, to me, a genre is a set of conventions that have evolved in a place mm -hmm. and in a time and for certain reasons. And um, they, I think, students appreciate us anatomizing those genres mm -hmm. and saying, this is how it works. Here are some of the rhetorical conventions that are important. Mm -hmm. And you can do that in a blog. You can do it in a research paper. And I think, you know, we're obviously teaching students in academic writing how to write for an academic audience. And there are obviously mm -hmm. all these other kinds of genres that are just as interesting. I don't really value one more than the other. But if you want to succeed at a university, this is how, you know, mm -hmm. scholars read and write and communicate. And, you know, you want to, uh, if you want to participate in a group, figure out its ethos, figure out how it communicates, mm -hmm. figure out how it values certain kinds of things and devalues others. And that, you know, it, that's true for the kinds of work we do professionally, but also for students and their, the way they communicate with their professors who are going to be assessing their work. And my sense is the most helpful thing I try to do is to just show them that there's no mystery. There's no mystification in language. There's no, you know, genres aren't mysterious things. They are made, they come from certain places, they change, and why not be fluent and functional in as many as possible. Mm -hmm. Write good love letters, write mm -hmm. good postcards, write good mm -hmm. research papers, mm -hmm. you know, and um, good graffiti mm -hmm. on the wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not in my house. <laughs> so. well, on that note, I want to thank all three of you for uh, sharing your ideas, and I uh, will post Cliff's address for the eloquent graffiti <laughs> yeah. that you're going to uh, leave on his walls. And, uh, yeah. But thank you very much, and I'm sure the uh, challenge of uh, trying to help our students become more accomplished writing is going to continue for all of our careers. But yeah. I want to thank you for sharing your insights.